This is actually my new book. I just finished it called The Protester's Handbook. And I haven't read it before, so my first time out. Um, appreciate sharing it with you today. And we'll chat about it afterwards, so um, I'll just dive into it. The Protester's Handbook. I chugged a Corona on the breakwater in Lake Michigan that held up the Adler Planetarium, a 12-pack of all that was left of the Spanish crown. The Aztec Empire brewed and distilled and distributed for a mass consumption seeping into my gut. I sat on the dark side of the grassy hill that raised the building with the huge telescope with the glow from the lights of the Chicago skyline falling around me like some messed up halo. I stared at the dark waters of the Great Lake where all the conquests that had gone down on the shore were buried, held in place with cement shoes, forgotten as we all moved on with business as usual. Inside the famous round dome, Adler charted the universe for us and let us take peeks out of it for just a few bucks. And that made sense because we couldn't see the stars anymore with our own eyes since the city lights had shot them all down. But as I took another sip, I knew that up there, just a few layers of air away, hid the Milky Way. The same stars that people like me had read to reveal the rhythm of the universe, to understand this land that we walked on, to look into the past and the future, to understand our spot in the universe. The line of buildings shooting off lights were called skyscrapers because they were scraping the stars out of the sky, scraping those old connections away, and leaving their own lines of light to follow, to guide us, to mesmerize us. Looking up, we could see only the most audacious celestial bodies dragging us to them with their immense gravity. Chicago's job was to keep you so busy down here that you never looked above eye glare level. Chicago gave you a pair of concrete shoes that reminded you that the streets had been divided up, numbered. Every bit of ground, skyline, and sky was claimed, except that night. After dusk, the dark, dirty water blurred into the obsidian sky, forming one dark curtain. Here English fell apart and began revealing itself to me. I was at the edge of that magic. Through fate and fighting, I'd arrived at the place of no more north. This was as far north as we could go in this country. We were always on the south side of things. On this side of the argument, my parents were born south of the border. The international version of the phrase, wrong side of the tracks. They struggled to get to El Norte, which for Mexicans was a synonym for the U.S. Once they were in the U.S., well, El Norte broke up into the north of El Norte and the south of El Norte. And they arrived in Texas, which was not just south, but deep south. My father wanted to keep getting north. For us, there were only two directions, two speeds, two sides of heaven, north or south. And El Norte was where the American dream was kept. And any day, we were bound to get there. They continued to struggle to work their way north to Chicago, as far north as they could get. And where did they wind up? In a neighborhood called, Bridgepi called Bridgeport on the friggin' south side. <laughs> We're always south of the promised land. English always messed with us like that. It was slippery, always changing, creating different meanings while it grew and grew unchecked, rampant in every direction, seemingly even into space. I think that's why, uh, because language was so slippery, that's why I picked English as a major. At least if I couldn't make the language sit still and answer for its crimes, at least I could get a better sense of how it morphed, maybe even figure out how to make it work for me. Tomorrow, even though it was possibly the last of my line, I'd be the first in my family to earn a college degree. I was sitting there on the eve of, on the eve of my college graduation alone. I could hear the cars flying by on Lakeshore Drive, sirens. I could hear kids screw the kids cruising and honking, looking for spots to drink, smoke up, maybe screw, but everybody avoided my dark grass. My classmates were out, maybe at keggers in honor of their tomorrow, maybe clubbing each other, maybe at dinner with parents. I just wanted to be alone for a bit longer. Well, I'd be alone, like it or not. My girlfriend, who didn't like to be called a girlfriend, was older, an artist, radical. She said that I had no reason to be proud of something that most families had been doing for six generations. She refused to attend my graduation. I lied to her and told her that I had 
all types of family coming into town. They were going to take me out to celebrate. Actually, I'd reached the end of my family. They'd been divided, conquered, my parents deceased. I lay there, dropped on the patches of dried grass and empty beer can bottles. The evolution of several generations, the prince delivered into the American dream, and my bonjour jeans, my cheap pointy black leather shoes, my Dago t-shirt to show off my biceps, and hanging over my broad shoulders and broader imagination in my black leather jacket, even though it was May and getting warmer and warmer. I had to wear my leather armor for the attack. At times, I looted myself that I could fit into this system around me easy, but I just didn't want to. At other times, I knew that no matter how hard I tried, I was just from a different cut. Other times, I suspected that there was something going on around me to always keep me out. My cheap suit was waiting alone at my empty home, waiting to carry me to my college graduation ceremony tomorrow. Next to it, the blue gown and cap. That would be the last border I respected. My family had sweat and bled to build these temples named after Adler, Sears, McCormick, Hancock, Wrigley, but there was no sign that we'd ever been here. People like me had to spray paint our names on walls. Our family names were never chiseled on the buildings. Our scratches and clawing on the pyramids our blood in the mortar at their base, our sweat, our sweat on the steel holding up the skyscrapers was forgotten, ignored. The city raised on our backs had turned its back on us. But in the city on the make, it wasn't wise to turn your back on anyone. We poured the cement for our unmarked graves holding up the steel towers of the skyline. My father broke his back raising the city and I'd break my back raising it to the ground. My dad had given his youth and energy into squeezing and shaking a living out of Chicago, and I'd multiply that 100-fold. We're the ones who rolled the stones to build these temples. We're the ones sacrificed on their altars. We're the ones rolled over by the stones when we moved too slow, crushed by the weights we could no longer bear. But Chicago didn't roll over me. This was my last day as a young, good brown man. I'd give the old school dances two last chances. Tonight, the version of me known simply as T would attend a bro t protest in front of Holy Name Cathedral. Tomorrow, the version of me known as my social security number would attend my college graduation ceremony at McCormick Place. I would then begin the first summer of my own ceremonies. I would discover the formulas, the incantations, the drugs to raise the Aztec god of war to turn these skyscrapers into tombstones in honor of all the spicks and wetbacks who'd been crushed for moving too slow after being dried up, chewed up, rolled over by the younger, hunger immigrants behind them. I would exact tributes for several generations. I would force the city to see the ghost of all of us rolled over by the city, smothered in its wake. Waking up tomorrow with a hangover from the American dream, I'd put on that undertaker suit for my next life and reap a grim harvest that was late in coming. People will look at the jagged, dragon teeth scowling of Chicago and imagine us. My ancestors paid their dues. I'm here to collect. This guy goes on to get his degree, throws his graduation up for grabs, uh, goes to job interviews, tells off bosses, um, starts mayhem because he's not going to settle just for any regular job because he figures his dad got this country, didn't speak English, had no degree. He says, I'm going to push Chicago to its maximum limit. He winds up, of course, because of that, getting the attention of city councilmen. And this is the first job interview that he has that he actually wants. Um, it's called The Graduate. My first day of work started with the interview. My dad prepared me for it. He didn't have a college degree or even a high school diploma, which is why he picked crops. But he knew how to work. Work because your life depends on it, he used to tell me. I've since added, and work until your life no longer depends on it. That's me. I smuggle his words across borders where if I'm caught, you can't tell which part is illegal, which part's legitimate, and which part I just made up. Get dirty. Get in the details, roots. Know the exact amount of pressure needed to pull the fruit from the grasp of the earth. Just how much pressure to apply to open a mind without busting the skull. The right tug, the talented pull, the giftedly timed heave. In college, I'd sink myself the first two weeks of a class just like my dad hustled and broadened his back, bent over, picking so fast it looked like he was punching the earth under his flurry. I'd spent 15 days reading all the books assigned by the gorgeous professor. 
especially those whose names she finally dropped, which revealed her intellectual fetishes. There are tons of books in the world, but just a few dozen that bottled her brain into becoming a professor. My dad's field of study was an alfalfa field. His semester was a, single, a season long. If he passed, he had money to feed his wife and kids. If he failed, that was not an option. This class could not be dropped, could not be taken over. There was no extra credit, there was no curve. But yes, there's always an honors program, and he was it. I once asked him when I was in second grade, my school had messed me up enough to ask him if we were rich. Dad, are we rich, little me asked. Dad answered, if a man has two hands to work with, he's rich. Little me knew that meant we were poor. <laughs> my dad worked in, worked in a field. I work out, out of fields. I don't care if, if I have to break in to gas stations to not work in a field. I will. No, I won't. I won't break into a bank. I'd first break into showbiz. I'd first break into your imagination. To do so, I work out. Exercise for the sake of exercise, the abstract application of force with no immediate or obvious financial gain or to answer a threat. My workout is my think in. Leisure hours my dad didn't have, but that he came to this country so that I could decide what to do with. My think in dictates my course, which crop, how much per pound, which text, which intellectual alfalfa will help me game the scale. My dad's grading scale was a scale. Have you ever held a pound of alfalfa leaves? Imagine picking the stuff, plucking it out of the greedy grasp of Mother Earth, selfish with her bounty, unsure of whether or not she can trust you with it, then we gobble it up. I'd throw my graduation ceremony up for grabs and out the window by starting a riot. I'd use my only job interview to pay inland steel back for slights against my father when he worked there. All this had impressed my beautiful girlfriend enough to finally let me have an interview with her dad, Chicago's only Mexican city councilman, who she hated, but who she knew was a mover and shaker. And there I was, across from a job that was mine to lose. Finally, America was working the way it was supposed to work. The end. And I believe I was instructed to then ask for questions if there were any. Um... How much of you is in there? I'm sorry? I'm not even Mexican, so. <laughs> Proud to be British. <laughs> uh, you know what it is? It's almost like a, a parallel universe. Uh, when I graduated, I kept hearing that it was a key to the city. And um, I'm glad I did it, but it just meant a new level of hard work. Yeah. And um, my parents were actually alive at the time, so I couldn't gamble a lot with, with their lives. But I thought, you know what, if I, if I didn't have anyone that would suffer because of my acts, this is where I, I would roll the dice. Um, and I think I've been able to do that in Houston. It's take gambles on different careers, institutions. Uh, so it's kind of this parallel universe where I, I kind of tried some of these things. So just a tiny bit. Un poquitito. No tanto. Telepathic questions. Cool. <laughs> 45. Right. Mm -hmm. How many stories have you written like all together? You know what? Um, actually, earlier when I asked me why I started to write, actually my first publication was in third grade. Um, uh, a wonderful teacher. She, um, she had us write these poems. So I wrote this poem, and um, back in that, back in the day, there were these things called mimeographs. Kids don't know that, though. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> They'd use that, but the ink you could smell it, right? <laughs> Big purple blotchy letters. Um, so they'd have one every week, and she's like, "I'm going to put this in the newsletter." I'm like, "Oh wow, that's nice." And um, didn't quite sink in, but that week, in the newsletter. Right under the lunch menu for Sloppy Joe's 
was my poem. And, uh, you know, my, my parents, they weren't on the PTA. My parents didn't bake cakes. My parents didn't show up for meetings because, you know, they were one of the few Mexican families there. And I was just the kid, you know. Next, next thing I know, like, hey, oh, you're the writer. I'm like, here were the, oh, you know, teachers from other classes saying, wow, I, I liked your poem. I was like, wow, you know, uh, parents come up to me, wow, you, you got a good future out of you. I was like, and people that I didn't even know, know I existed. So this was in third grade when I started publishing that. Um, so I've been writing for a long time. And these are just some of the works that are published. I have a lot of stuff that's not published. Uh, do you write? That means yes, but do I admit it in public? <laughs> <laughs> if you were to write, what would you write? Poems, stories? Mm, very good, very good. And, and guess what? If I don't tell this story, it doesn't get told. If um, you know, it, you've got something from your area, your background, that if you don't tell it, it doesn't get told. Um, my mom, she taught herself how to read. Uh, very smart woman. She's not deceased. <laughs> But I would record all her stories, a video record, an uh, audio recorder, at about five years worth of that. Um, when she passed away, you know, um, at a funeral, I played that for my sisters. They bawled. But I realized I've got the family legacy uh, right there, and it's influenced a lot of, of my writing, my history. Same thing with your families. Uh, there's got to be one of us that are scribe for the tribe that take those stories down and, and pass it on. Because otherwise it evaporates, and people will appreciate it later. At the time, you don't realize that you're making history, but but that's what's kind of going on. So so many stories, not all of them, all of them published. Are there any anybody any other writers in the room? Any young writers? Couple. <laughs> <laughs> so I actually um. Growing up in Chicago, I went to DePaul University, which was on the north side. And um, I just, I wasn't exactly sure what I wanted to do. I knew I wanted to write. Um, and I needed to get a degree. So a lot of uh, great writers, like Hemingway, Ring Lardner, said so they were journalists first. I'm like, I guess you're a journalist first, and then you become a huge, famous novelist or something, right? And then, um, so I, I studied journalism with a communications degree. And basically, once I graduated, I uh, wanted to get a, keep writing. I had a job right out of college um, at the time, which was what you were supposed to get. Still wasn't happy. I found out about creative writing programs, which is where I wound up getting a Master of Fine Arts in creative writing. And that helped me a lot to get, understand how writing works, how the market works. So, and then from then on, just started working on publishing and all that. So that's two degrees. You think? <laughs> Anybody angry in the room? <laughs> There's a lot of stuff to me. Well, you, you know what? When I was really young, I had a chip on my shoulder. And, you know, I didn't know why, but I'm like, you know, it bothered me that I couldn't know why. Like, I'm like, you know what? There's something wrong here. I couldn't put it into words. I know it was wrong. So, but at the same time, the one good thing was I was smart. So it was like I was one of these guys. I could, what was bad at the time too, South Side of Chicago, if you were a, a book nerd, that wasn't a good thing to be. You know? But I happened to be, at the time, the right size. You know? Uh, my, dad was, my dad was very rough on me. So, so I grew up hard. And, and it was like, you know what? Yeah, I'm reading a book. Got some got a problem with that, you know? Um, so I was mad at a lot. I think looking back, I'm like, you know what? I, I think at the time, uh, young people, we see, at the time, you see things. You have a vision, and you can't put it into words because it's a vision. The rest of the world, the rest of the world has to catch up to that. There aren't even words to put that into. You mentioned the name of the organization, Nuestra Palabra, Latino Writers Having to Say. Even when I started that, I had a vision of what it is. Now we know what it is, but there was nothing like it. It would take forever to explain what it was. And I think that's the power of art. It's bigger than our to-do lists, and it's outside of the regular imagination. But something's eating at you, 
And it's because it can't put into words that, that it eats you. Um, I think on a more uh, academic level, because I am, I'm actually Mexican American, I'm not British. Uh, <laughs> the, um, People expect a certain type of story, and the traditional stories were protest novels. So one thing going into this is I wanted to write a protest novel, but early on critiques were that these books weren't aesthetically sound, saying that it didn't have characterization, the writing wasn't up to snuff. So what I want, and by the same token, I think literary novels are boring. You know? <laughs> and, and I'm a book nerd, and I think some of them are boring. <laughs> so what I wanted to do is kind of take the excitement of the protest novel, plot, action, with the aesthetics of a literary novel, and kind of trick people. Because as the book gets further into it, I start bringing out a little more of that. So I try to combine all those things in there. Uh, so I think at first level, it's going to seem simply like a protest novel. When I'm dead a good 15 years after that, uh, people will go back and say, oh, OK, look at, this, look at this mechanics with language. Look at this uh, evolution of um, characterization. Um, so I'm trying to play a little bit with that, and, and I'm trying to revisit my youth, and try, really I'm still trying to figure out, you know, what kind of beef I had with, uh, <laughs> with the world. Uh, hopefully get the last laugh on the world, I don't know, we'll see. Well, we've been trying by making, uh, er earlier today too, at the presentation, I mentioned some of the activities we do to, to bring uh, writers that most people will enjoy. So we've worked with celebrities to try and get books in the households. I think what we've got to do is uh, just create really exciting books now and think about, um, okay, what do people want to read? Because back in the day, like if a Kurt Vonnegut, get, Kurt Vonnegut book came out, that, people were lying in lines for that. Now it's for video games. You know, uh, so I think what we, we, we yeah we need to keep kind of updating what books are, bringing new writers. Um, we have a radio show in Houston. We do mega book events. We're about to launch a magazine, uh, multimedia presence. I don't think it's that people don't like books. Um, like personally, I, I I hate movies. I hate the cinema. I hate the cinema. My wife says it's because I'm jealous because they make so much more money than writers. Maybe, <laughs> maybe that is the case. Um, but I don't want to know when Spider-Man 3 comes out. I knew when Spider-Man 3 came out. It was on billboards. If you bought food at a, <laughs> at a grocery store, it was on the cover of magazines. The people in the film were on the magazines. If you saw a little kid, their t-shirt said, Spider-Man 3. Um, in newspaper ads, it's crazy because Walmart has ads with little TVs in there. Looking through there, it's like the TV, which they're selling, has a screen and there's Spider-Man 3. I'm like, oh my, this is like everywhere. A great book comes out. This is like underground. You're, you're like part of a secret cult now, you know? <laughs> and, and it's kind of like, you know, um, and I think it's a Texas thing too. People don't think that it's just, people, when the New York publishing world thinks of Texas, they're not just saying, oh, just the Mexicans aren't reading. They don't think anybody in Texas reads. <laughs> They think we're on horses, we got lassos. So they don't even try and sell books here, and now it's hurting them. So right now the New York publishing world is suffering for business. They're paying for their sins. And uh, you know, here we are, a community of readers and writers. We're, we're the, we are creating new networks. I think it's gonna hit soon. And um, the work that you're doing here, this is gonna be a major center uh, for our literature as well. You got ABR, Fiction Collective 2, Centro Victoria, um, Macarena Hernandez, she's actually um, an amazing writer uh, with the Dallas Morning News. Um, she was plagiarized by a New York Times journalist. She was famous throughout the country. Um, who else? Um, who's this guy, uh, the hate radio guy? Um, not Rush. Um, the other guy, I can't think of his name. O'Reilly. O'Reilly was after Macarena. So O'Reilly came after Macarena. She's tough. She's here teaching. She'll be teaching you classes. Dagoberto Gil, one of my mentors, he'll be coming here to teach. This is, it's got it going on, and it's plus, this is going to be a huge time. This, this campus is by all these other cities. What I'm saying is, this is getting bigger by the day as New York gets smaller. 
So I, I think what we got to do is stay alive, prosper, have a great time, read some books, inspire some people. And, and I think we're near this exciting renaissance. So uh, you, you guys are delivered into the promised land. Mm. I guess you could say two or three years ago because of Dr. Venegas. And of course, he's not teaching it any longer. I don't know if they're offering it there at UC anymore. But it started off with Sandra. And now I can't get enough of the That's Spanish great. literature. And it started off with uh, Dr. Bell Trujillo when he came over here a couple of years ago and spoke. Wow. I've, written, I've read every one of his books. And I'm really excited about it. starting to going to start reading your series because, I mean, it's just like I'm like a sponge. That's thrilling. That'd be great. I mean, thank you. I appreciate no, no, that, that's exciting to hear. The other thing, you mentioned Spanish. I think um, what's interesting, too, is this book actually has no Spanish. Um, if you're writing in Texas, uh, Barbara uh, Bernard Gonzalez just wrote a book, and it's in Spanglish. It goes back and forth. I know you lose some readers for that, for better or for worse. You just, you just kind of do. And that's a particular tricky point for Latino writers. But for me, I grew up on the south side of Chicago. I thought I was speaking English. I got to college, you're like, is that English you're speaking? I'm like, yeah, it's South. <laughs> of course it's English. We're talking about you. Know? Um, so even our English is separate. But in this, it's not such an issue because the parents are gone, that connection's gone, and it's in Chicago. I think the other thing that happens too as well is, guess what? When people market to Latinos, they think just put it in Spanish. Houston is a huge uh, number of Mexican-Americans. Um, and we're about to launch a magazine called Aztec Muse. Uh, viewpoint. It's kind of like a GQ, believe it or not, for Mexican American males, 30 to 42, all in English. A lot of my guys now, they're, they're very successful, and they don't speak Spanish. And guess who gives them the hardest time about that? Other Latinos. They give them the hard time, and it's what, guess what, the one, what happened is that their parents were so discriminated against for speaking Spanish that they're like, I don't want my kid to go through that. And of course, the irony of discrimination is, then along comes the most powerful Latina advocate, Dora the Explorer. <laughs> She's powerful. Dora's powerful. And she made it cool to speak Spanish. So here are all these guys who are 30. And it was, wow, it's cool to speak Spanish. Do you speak Spanish? No. <laughs> now they catch it again. And, and also, the other thing that happened, too, and it happened to me, if you speak English really well, you get rewarded quickly and obviously. So, uh, you know, on, on our cover issue, we got one guy, he's one of the youngest bank presidents, Mexican-American, doesn't speak a lick of Spanish. Brilliant English speaker, brilliant mind. Uh, another guy, when you look at construction sites, you think where the guy's laying the brick, Tony Garcia owns the bricks. You know, he's, he's in his 30s, owns a construction firm, million dollar institution. Uh, another guy's an engineer. Uh, on our radio show every Tuesday, we're about to interview this guy, Hernandez, who's an astronaut. But all these guys were rewarded, obviously, speaking English really well. I think another myth that hurts us, because it's, it's kind of this emotional, you get this English-only stuff. Um, of course you got to learn English when you get here. You know, I know so many immigrants. I don't know one of them that doesn't want to. I know some of them that are embarrassed when they're corrected. I know some of them are like 30, and they don't want a 13-year-old correcting them. I know some of them that work so hard they can't take classes. But there's the myth that they don't want to learn English. They know to prosper, they have to. I learned that quick. And guess what? Here's the irony, actually, one article we have. It is now just as hard for that 30-year-old 
Mexican immigrant who's working too hard. It's, it's hard for him to learn English as it is for a successful Mexican-American male who studied to learn Spanish. That's just crazy. <laughs> it's crazy. Because if you're younger, there's schools and different things, but there's this weird melon. And again, we're separated by these languages. And again, I mean, um, I want my people to succeed, so I'm an English teacher, you know? Um, and th that's kind of like this interesting mixing point of, of identity. But I think right now, what's happening is we're articulating it differently and things are going to change uh, you know with, with this generation of folks I'm hoping someday that the young people will look at this video and say wow that those are the problems back then it'll be like wow really that was those are the issues it's not a big deal now and uh, I think I think we're close to that and this is the generation of folks that'll that'll get it done I agree completely with you. Oh, I, I agree with you completely. And I think one of the things with art is to build those bridges, those emotional bridges. It, what's funny too is, um, you know who's been doing it? Our chefs. <laughs> Our chefs have been doing that. And, uh, what, what's interesting to me is that um, I'll go to Mexican restaurants in Houston. There's like no Mexican in there. You know, the, the cooking is like the food's conquered. The, the other interesting thing to me too is that. Um, li but what's what's interesting is we're finally like meeting each other, be it internet or other. We're finally meeting each other because before we couldn't. Like you, you lived in that neighborhood. I lived in this one. And I think what's happening is it's so unique that when we do an event, a writing event, typically they're mostly in English, we get calls from people. And they're like, you know what, I'm not Latino, can I come? And it's, you know, <laughs> you know? And, and I'm like, yeah, you know? And I think about this though, as an educator though, my thing, when I was younger, I probably would've gotten mad. Now that I'm an educator, I'm like, I need, this is a chance to, to open doors. And what I say is, yes, you can. And what I think in the back of my head is, you know, when y'all get together with your friends and decide to go have pizza, do you call the Italian restaurant and say, hey, we're not Italian, but you know, <laughs> Can we come down and eat there, you know? <laughs> because we're familiar with that. We've had that, that, that interchange. Um, what's interesting, too, it's, it's Mexican food leading the way. When you have other groups, like I know that there's, there's been a few places like Puerto Rican food. People don't know what it is, and they don't quite get there. So I, I agree with you. We need these pinpoints. And I think, too, now that's kind of the new movement is to say there is none. I think there's two movements. One is to say let's keep blending. I think the other one, which we're doing with the magazine, is to articulate demographics really well because at the end of the day, um, there is a machine out there that reduces all of us to caricatures. It's not just me being profiled, all of you are. And the reason is to get the five bucks in your pocket into someone else's pocket. So they're like, where are you from? Uh, what's your, uh, how much do you make? What will you buy? Because demographics runs this country. They want to know how to get to you. So we are all reduced to one dimension. I, as a writer, refuse to let that happen, refuse to condone that. And I think art is the thing that's going to melt, melt these borders. But we're still in America. And my job is to teach students how do you go from one demographic to another, how do you use language to kind of move system to system. But what's exciting is that we're having the dialogue. So we're having this discussion. It's going on now versus before. It was just all theory. And we're kept away from the experts. These are hard questions, by the way. <laughs> Do you think our current administration is, uh, is, is more helpful in broadening that dialogue that you're talking about? You mean the president? Yeah. Of the... <laughs> of the... Con <laughs> 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 I think he is. <laughs> 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 Obviously, Dr. Hunter is just a great person. More than his part, but I <laughs> You, you know,
know what's interesting to me is I think the dialogue is, is changed by the fact that we have an African American president. The dialogue has changed completely. And I think what's going to happen too is that there is now the, the school of thought where the cream will rise to the top. So excel at what you do and you will prevail. And, and there's one testament. But I also think at the same time, we still need to articulate the little niches because for me, like, um, you know, CNN is doing Latino in America. Nice idea, but that's mad. Calculus to me is articulating the demographic that we got in Houston. Uh, and again, doing things that, that, that build the bridges. So our magazine is going to be very cool. It's going to be in English. It's going to be an awesome magazine that non-Latinos are going to like and can read. And they'll be attracted to it. But it's so specific. Uh, let me give one quick analogy. I call it the Seinfeld phenomenon. You know, um, Seinfeld, Jewish, New York, smarmy, a lot of free time. I'm none of those things. <laughs> I love that show. It hit its demographic so well that people outside there got it. And I think that's what the, the people who are doing calculus, I'm doing the calculus of race and ethnicity, which is taking different niches and trying to figure out how to fit it. So I think what we have right now are these two scales. And now people are having discussions in Maine because of the administration being what it is. And I think what's wise, too, is we can't mandate it. You know, I think in the old days, we're like, you know, you're going to read this or, you know, <laughs> read these books. And it worked a little bit, but we still need to inspire and capture imaginations. And I think uh, the administration's smart, but also just the fact uh, the president being who he is is going to inspire people just to think differently in ways that we couldn't before. Was that the brief last question? Ms. Dooling, will be the last one. That's great. And what grade do you teach? Um, That's fantastic. By the way, you're a fantastic teacher because you brought your students here. And here you are worrying about these, these guys. So that's, that's awesome. That's awesome. Speech. Speech. That's awesome. In the neighborhood. Party? Party in the neighborhood? <laughs> You know what, one of my favorite writers, again, not a Latina writer, Flannery O'Connor, from the South, of course, brilliant writer, what she said is, if you've lived in a family, you got enough material. <laughs> you got enough material. Now, what's different, we got to separate two things. What a New York editor, publisher wants is different. What true readers and writers want, we want that true, authentic voice. This is what I want. And I got to balance hats because part of me is a marketing kind of guy and I'm a weird writer because I love that. I just love beautiful, powerful stories. And I'm sure a lot of your students have that voice. So as the media says all these things, I'm glad to have you champion I'm saying, write it down. Write it down. So. It's amazing what comes out with That's the same cool. family. You know, what one person saw from over here, somebody else saw from way over here. And all the cousins just get on and throw it all out there. Thanks for the technology. Story. Yeah. It's a story. So the last statement will be a, a, a push for high tech Aztecs. You've been, <laughs> <laughs> you've been a wonderful audience. Thank you very much. I appreciate it.